Hello and welcome to Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery. Um, today we're going to have a look at the exhibition Shift, Thinking Globally, Acting Locally. Um, just a couple of things before we get started. Uh, we have programming, a great lineup of programming that you should make sure you check out at rifegallery.eventbrite.com and sign yourself up for. Um, Today, our curator, Maria Seder reader is going to take us through this exhibition. We're going to have a great conversation about the work. Uh, if you have questions, pop them into the comments, and we'll make sure that we get to them. So without too much further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Maria. Please enjoy. Hi, I'm Maria Seder reader I'm the guest curator for SHIFT. Um, thank you so much to the Ohio Arts Council for your excellent platform for artists in Ohio. And um, this show really started in 2019, thinking about the ways in which artists are um, watering the ground upon which they stand. Um, so it feels like the right kind of a show for the Ohio Arts Council um, and this exhibition space. The shift that we're hoping is that artists are often the first responders to um, worldwide events and they're kind of manifesting in the world the ways in which change and um, the constant evolution that happens in life uh, it looks like what it looks like and how it might exist in the world so um, there are 11 artists in shift um, all of them ohio based this uh, work here is created by Tracy Featherstone, who's out of Hamilton, Ohio. She's a Miami University uh, Oxford uh, professor who works in printmaking um, and sculpture. And her work here is a really creative use of materials. She looks at um, things that would be normally cast off and thrown away. Um, you'll see behind me these overspray compositions, um, which would have been just a, a way for her to cover the surface of um, her, works, her workspace in order to protect it from uh, overspray that she was painting on another work. And when she went back and looked at these beautiful paper um, you know, coverings, it, ultimately, she thought that it was uh, really lovely and she wanted to reimagine what uh, the kind of works could be. So she cut them up, recomposed them, added more layers of drawings and um, uh, textures to it to kind of make them their own works of art. And then you'll see in the middle these Yanni um, portraits or paintings where she's taking the um, materials that have been loved upon and worn and and used and overused and the ways in which um, that has an effect on these materials um, and instead of throwing them away and discarding them for future use she's really trying to um, reimagine what um, art can use um, to reinvigorate old materials So Amanda's getting some close up here so you can see where paint has been applied and the materials have been deconstructed and reconstructed. Um, the really, the texture from far away feels um, completely together, but as you come closer to it, you recognize the many parts to the whole. Yeah, so there's embroidery, there's painting, there's drawing, there's, um, mending, um, fixing, um, adhering, really interesting creative use of materials. Yeah, like here you can tell that that was worn and loved and, and perhaps other areas those holes were made by the artist. work in this room is a site-specific installation by the artist M. Carmen Lane, a terrific artist uh, who runs their own um, Atonsic Healing Center um, in Cleveland. And um, this is a, a kind of memorial to a 
the Shrum Burial Mound and the effigy just outside of present day Columbus. Um, so it's a, a kind of portal to a, a different time spatial uh, dimension in which um, we might reimagine the colonial gaze. And yeah, if you don't mind checking out that space. It even really smells good in there. to the good folks at Obelisk in town in Columbus who really helped us troubleshoot some of the AV needs for that installation. Um, around throughout the gallery, you'll see the work uh, by um, Dayton, Ohio-based artist Kevin Harris. He is a professor at Sinclair Community College, himself a printmaker, who is really um, taking imagery and recontextualizing and remixing um, photographs that he's taken on the street, found imagery, um, and asking us who is being centered, whose lives and um, needs are being valued. This particular piece by Kevin is a, a double layering of uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, mugshot from Montgomery, Alabama, when he was uh, protesting bus segregation in 1964, and um, upon the face of Trayvon Martin. Um, so we're sort of seeing these layering and uh, questioning of who is criminalized um, and who might not be. So these are the um, gorgeous portraits by Autumn Bland, who is an Akron-based photographer, who began in March 2020 a series of uh, pandemic portraits. Uh, so she interviewed and photographed uh, essential workers, um, people who were on the front lines during the pandemic, and folks who felt uh, compelled to really um, stay home and to take care of their bodily health and needs um, and in doing so like so many of us sacrifice so much The work here is by Lauren Davies who is a Cleveland based um, multimedia artist she starts with photographs and um, sends them off into mass-produced, uh, you know, Walmart tapestries where you can get your photographs created into um, a blanket, and then deconstructs, pulls them apart, reweaves them, um, recontextualizes the imagery. A lot of which of the photographs come from sites of kind of urban decay and um, industrial um, wasteland. So you'll see um, brown sites of you know former institutions, um, both industrial institutions and reformatory institutions. Um, and um, she is doing multiple things all at once. She's really kind of interweaving, um, literally and figuratively, metaphorically, these um, questions for viewers, asking us to consider whose lives are valuable, how do we look at sites and reimagine the possibilities within them. Great. Let's make sure that we um, pop back over. We missed a couple of pieces on the, oh, the way over. I want to make sure that we see yeah. all of the, the works in the show so uh, we can see Lauren's on the way back, but also hit a couple more pieces by Kevin. So some of the printmaking um, by Kevin is, as you'll see here on the left, Agua de Beber, based on the 
famous bossa nova tune um, and a reference to Flint, Michigan's water crisis. Um, and the imagery, art historical imagery of the cherub, um, who is, you know, weaponized with their bow and arrow. And in this case, Kevin is using knives and guns, um, along with this iconography of the bee. So you'll see the bee throughout this series, as well as throughout the entire gallery. There's um, that reward for looking that I hope um, art can allow us to, to provide for viewers uh, to you know look around you and to discover the the pollinator series these hive um, bees that exist in more than just these spaces um, reminding us that like the cherubs the bees too um, can hold difficult truths um, all at once so you know bees are something that we rely on for pollination and our own human um, survival, but um, for some people they might be considered a threat. You know, folks can be allergic to bees. Um, we consider them as scary, quote unquote, um, for a lot of folks. Um, and so you'll see this bee iconography throughout as a kind of larger metaphor for the artist. All right, and as we come back, let's get a little bit closer on Lauren's work. Um, I thought it was really interesting as you were talking, Maria, about how uh, she uses these mass-produced fabrics and then breaks them down. So really the threads that, that come out are kind of important too and also reference back to the images. So let's, let's make sure we get some close-ups so our audience can see that nice and closely. I also yeah. really enjoy the, the shadows that are cast mm. in these as well. Yeah, the threads, I think you can never really see the individual colors until you get up close. Um, far away, they look to be way more of a muted. Um, and upon closer inspection, you can get those really bright um, reds and greens and blues that you wouldn't see otherwise. Yeah. There's certainly a lot of care and love that goes into each one of these objects. Um, extremely considerate artist. It's, a, it's that type of artwork where when you're looking at it, you're really trying to figure out how this artist did this. Like, yeah. it's that I, I know that, you know, lots of folks as they're viewing artwork want to comprehend the artist's hand. And in this, you know it's there, but you can't quite figure it out um, unless you have a little bit of backstory. Yeah, a lot of these artists are doing so much research off-site, not necessarily even just in their studios. They're, like many of us, existing in the real world and, and having their own sort of human needs as, as people. And so, you know, having a studio was uh, a challenge, I think, for a lot of folks over the past uh, year of uh, precarity in employment and, you know, um, for a lot of artists, what they are doing is showing up in person. So, you know, the materiality of the work is really important. Um, but I also think that this was, this past year has been um, a way to reimagine what uh, art making can look like and in what spaces those might, um, might really serve that need. You know, Lauren moved into a new studio this past year this piece is also Lauren's just over here. In the, it's a little bit harder to see in the window, so I apologize for our viewers, but I think Amanda will just get a little closer and, and try and show you. This is called Brick by Brick. So it's using that same tenet of you know Lauren's photography and then reimagined into shape and retooling into brick-shaped bricks um, that she has a lot of freedom for how it can be installed. And that's super interesting. And in, in, in a playful approach to you know, more heavy conceptual works, I think artists who are working with materials like this um, are doing really good, good work. Thanks for getting down there, Amanda. <laughs> Appreciate it. We'll go over to Danielle. Yeah. Danielle Julian Norton is a teacher at CCAD, does 
really um, is a great teacher from everyone that I've ever spoken with, but also an artist who I love to work with. Um, she was in a show of mine in the past and is just joyous, I think, in terms of her um, art practice. So this is a little bit of a, a, um, a diversion from her usual approach, which is to create these kind of gigantic oversized contraptions um, within, you know, uh, museum and gallery spaces. And, and this one feels way more intimate. She called it a Dada gesture um, because it's, it's taking objects that you might recognize or might have some kind of um, previous experience with and might be familiar objects that we don't necessarily associate with quote unquote art. Um, and really rewards the viewer in their looking. There's a lot about getting up and close and personal to these objects to find more ideas um, about them. So um, she's really created um, composition on the wall of objects that have been both um, handmade and found. So referring to both you know, mass production as well as the human hand. I, I, we were chatting about this a little bit earlier, but one thing that I really enjoy about Danielle's work, and this is from Danielle's own, own mouth, she is very serious about the absurd. And what I love about that is that it is a validation of the necessity of play. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, this is this feels as you approach it really serious. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have these Easter eggs where yes. you get a little closer, and it's the, is it the trolley that, the, um, this references an animal that is also a fossil. Um, I'm going to get it wrong. It's not the tardigrade, is it's it? It's the tardigrade. Okay. It references the tardigrade, which is indestructible, right? Yeah. So outlive us and has been around forever. Has, right. Yeah. It's crazy. And then you come over here to this kind of spider shape situation mm -hmm. and if you look close enough you get a little easter egg of a flaming hot cheeto in the middle yeah right there which you know is suspended in this kind of resin so you know they're all of these kind of it's like taking low art and high art and saying it's all important it is all important yeah. all of it creates the landscape yeah yeah So these portraits, originally done in brownie format, but then, um, what's brownie format? It's an old camera, uh, aperture lens based uh, uh, material that doesn't really, I, I don't know that they even still make these. Um, uh, and so Amber J. Anderson is the artist who created these works that are really kind of um, interested in mystery and intimacy in the home as a site of, you know, self-care. Um, she was inspired by Emily Dickinson's One Need Not Be a Chamber to be Haunted and kind of imagined herself as a ghost within these spaces, haunting them, um, as well as contemporary novelist Susanna Clarke's Piranesi's um, book novel. So not only did she take the images of these, but she built all of these. Yeah, the Victorian houses uh, that were, you know, come in a kit, and she hand built them all, and then really wanted to like make them feel monumental, make them feel like a, a space that someone could inhabit. So then she, using that brownie format, um, you know, worked digitally to give it a real filling a film. What I also really appreciate about this work is that they do have that intimacy. Mm -hmm. um, and a part of that intimacy reflects back upon us the experience that all of us have been grappling with for the past year and a half, which is how do we make home um, in the space of a global pandemic? It, home has become so much more important. It's, I think about the title, Houses I've Haunted, mm -hmm. And there's something really universal in that at this time where everyone is trying to, to carve out space for themselves 
Um, what does that look like? You know, we've seen this boom in, in house projects or in people buying houses, and the, it just, it feels so relevant and so timely, mm -hmm. um, but also slightly playful. Um, there's there's a, a, a bit of a silver lining to it. Yeah, I think there's a joyful um, reclaiming of the home and a, a kind of imagination and, and similar to Danielle's, that kind of play as a necessity for self-care and, and safety. Yeah, absolutely. And they're really beautiful. They're the kind of work that when you come into the space, which by the way, you all get to come into the space if you would like, we have hours now. Um, you, you want to get up close. You want to look at them in detail and see the, all of the trim and the, the carefulness therein um, and hope that maybe you might see something in a window. Um, there's art that you, know, you can step back from and you certainly can step back from this and appreciate the, the series of it, but the real reward is in your personal interaction with each one, getting closer and building kind of a relationship. Yeah, and speaking of the body um, and one's relationship to home and safety, um, Alison Crescetta is an artist who we invited, who I invited to normally, uh, you know, in their in her normal practice, she is a performance artist, um, and performance really requires that kind of interaction with another person and or an audience, um, and. So she was really trying to um, depart from her typical approach to performance for this. I think, you know, like so many of us, uh, we're required to find new um, avenues for our usual thing that we do. Um, and this was a time for her to put performance art aside and turn to her training in the healing arts. Um, and so she, um, what you'll see in the gallery is the image of the, the uh, seven chakras, uh, which she uses in a Reiki session, and then the figure. Um, so it's very just abstract kind of, you know, uh, presentation, but the real uh, installation is interactive and accessible via QR code in the gallery. Um, and so folks can have a distanced Reiki session with Crescetta, who is herself a, a level two Reiki master, practitioner, excuse me. Um, and um, that's the performance that will happen. It'll be off-site, it won't be in the gallery, um, but so it's a way forward for all of us, for the artist and thinking about their own performance practice, but also for the visitor and that engagement of, you know, how can we care for our, our one vessel that we are given in this you know life in this lifetime. So there's there is something really interesting in the connection that that is made. Um, you know Allison being a performance artist that you you mentioned a little earlier about the importance for a performance artist is the engagement of an audience. Yeah. And so this piece is really all about engagement with the audience, but it's really one-to-one. Uh, -one. Yeah, it's not a, it's not, it's a, it's a way more intimate performance. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's not too many uh, artists, performers who do that one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, performance. Of, but I think that it's, it is a new approach to being really authentic your practice and you know how more how much more of a you know really um, I don't know loaded uh, rapport or experience can you have with another person besides that one on one kind of back and forth um, especially one that's really prioritizing the human body and caring for somebody else and thinking about even within the title of shift Allison really had to shift. The, like perhaps more than than most mm -hmm. uh, her standard practice is completely altered and has to be imagined new similar to how we have all had to imagine new and operate new um, sometimes for the good right so that's kind of exciting 
hopefully you saw in the background uh, one of the hive. You have to come in to see all of them. You can't see all of them on the video, but there is one more bee from the hive. Um, so this installation is uh, the work of Lorena Molina, who's an artist, multidisciplinary artist from El Salvador. Um, and it's leave her, her homeland um, in order to seek safety elsewhere. So we see this hope for um, creating a home. Raspberries are, have to be in the ground in one location for at least two years before they can bear any fruit. So she really sees them as a kind of material of hope. Um, you know, next to and embedded within this, these other materials that are, are kind of more loaded with um, symbolic meaning. For uh, Lorena, the red clays about the violence that has happened in her homeland um, and really represents that. And then on either side of this installation, you'll see these uh, moving gifts that say, do you feel safe? Do you feel free? Um, really a, a, a series of, of mantras that have been playing in her head for the past couple of years um, in terms of thinking not just about her own life and childhood, but you know, also in this moment that we're all constantly thinking, you know, what does freedom look like? What does safety look like? She also talks about how beds and um, you know rooted plants are are signs of hope and signs of home. So these kind of diametrically opposed ideas being kind of woven together and a push and pull between yeah. them. It's like a questioning and an answer or a hope and a fear. Sure. So you know all homemade plant. Uh, pots and then you know thinking about digital art and how you put that together and how Jeff would repeat and repeat um, you know we all consume art daily through uh, whatever kind of media whether it be your your smartphone or perhaps on your television certainly uh, screens screens I mean, screens are how this you know due to the pandemic that most of the majority of this um, Curating happened over screens, and it is a, a new site for a lot of artists to get their work out. Um, there's obviously there's this constant care and tending and love that needs to be given to the um, the plants. Um, so I think that's maybe a good segue between Lorena's and Ha's work, um, both of which require of the. Um, the gallery attendants, a cat chiefly among them, <laughs> to really love and, and tend to these plants every day, um, you know, for hours at a time. Um, so this is the work of Ha Zhang, um, who is a Cincinnati-based uh, artist and teacher at the University of Cincinnati. Um, I came to know her work through um, our, we were colleagues at the University of Cincinnati, and this piece death, growth, repeat, is a kind of meditation on the ways in which, um, you know, how can we care for a living thing in an unstable environment, in a precarious, you know, environment. And so, as you'll see, there's so many materials that she's using that are really rich with meaning. We have chia seeds that are, um, you know, lovingly put on top of these graveyard markers, gravestone markers, um, upon which are, you know, they're, they're sitting on these huge concrete blocks. And then if you look closely, they, those blocks, those really heavy blocks seem to float upon these mass-produced bathroom-like tiles. So there's a reference to you know, places of rep repose and cleansing, as well as places of mourning. Um, as well as life continuing, this kind of, you know, uh, ultimate deny, demise of a, of a life cycle. Um, you know, something will have a, a, a termination um, at some point. And so, uh, growth, death, growth, repeat, excuse me, um, is this kind of installation that asks us to meditate upon those really big concepts, but in, uh, I think, rewarding ways.
it was really beautiful to get to see uh, the stages of this growth as well. You can kind of see on this first tombstone how the chia seeds looked when they were first applied down towards the base. And then uh, the artists, you know, it takes a lot of research and, and knowledge of the care of, of this type of thing to understand how to get them to sprout within a certain amount of time and then to see them grow um, and then kind of become leggy and reaching for the light um, and knowing that at some point uh, these chia seed sprouts will, will die, they'll go beyond their capacity and then that becomes the piece. So th this evolving piece of work is such an interesting um, concept to get to really observe mm -hmm. as a part of the, the gallery here. Yeah, I bet you could come at all different kinds at times throughout this, what, three months, two months mm -hmm. cycle of this exhibition and see them um, in different stages of their life cycle. Yeah. I really love the, the different textures that you get from where you can see the sprouts reaching for the light mm -hmm. um, and how, you know, some kind of double back on themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, also, in. yeah, and lean in, right? It's a, it's a, such a, I, I love to think about those type of things and how that introspectively, oh. you know, like yeah. what, how do I reach we for are light? Like heliotropic. Yeah. Creatures, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And then really Terrence's work, which is very lunar, um, is about maybe the other well not the other side of the coin. They're all they're all having conversations. I think these artists in the show, I hope they're all having conversations with each other's work. But this is um, the series, The Beat, It Will Always Save Us, of really tender portraits of dancing couples screen printed um, as a love letter to black joy, which according to Terrence Hammonds, um, the artist, is so big and boundless that it could possibly have its own orbit. Um, Terrence is an artist I've worked with multiple times in, uh, he's from Cincinnati like myself. He's a printmaker, um, but he works in all kinds of, those prints can be on ceramic vases, they can be on, on uh, you know, canvas, they can be on wood, and um, he really uses printmaking in a kind of imaginative way. So uh, both of these pieces are really a love letter to black joy, but um, you'll also see on the left, uh, an older piece, you have to get up to get down, which is a dance floor. It features um, images from the civil rights era, really it's a, a visual archival portrait of his mom's um, life and there is a, a dance um, track that you can get a QR code for on the label on the wall here in the gallery. Um, we, have, we have three QR codes we do. in the show. Oh, yeah. um, so um, you can, you know, you, viewers are encouraged to, you know, get up before they get down to, you know, really <laughs> see the ways in which joy can maybe have a, uh, you know, a way to leverage um, the change that is happening in the world that's constant, right? The only constant is change. Um, and so knowing that that shift is constantly occurring, I think is what all of the artists in the show are really um, trying to materialize and, and to, to get audiences to be able to see, you know, it's the, it's the demonstrating, the showing, not the telling. Um, I'm really proud to be associated with all the artists in the show. Um, did I miss yeah. anything? No, I think we're gonna talk a little bit more, but um, for our viewers that are out there, if you have questions, please pop them in the comments. We're gonna get to that. Uh, I think what is so interesting to me, actually one of our artists, Carmen, um, came in yesterday to, to put the final touches on their piece. And what struck me, Carmen shared that this exhibition really feels like the whole of Ohio. Mm. Like, as they walked through the exhibition, they could see the, the geographic diversity of the artists. Mm. And I hadn't considered that. Yeah. And then I looked with that, you know, asking those questions yeah, and that, thinking about it yeah. with that difference. I thought that was really beautiful. Oh, yeah. Carmen's a brilliant thinker. And, and yeah, I think 
that's what art and artists allow us to do, is to have a new lens to look at the world around us, right? To say that maybe the end of a baseball bat or, and or a flaming hot Cheeto can be art. Um, if we contextualize it as much, if we you know, can make sense of it, if the research supports that, like that is the story. Um, and, I, and I just love um, being able to um, create those kinds of stories for visitors to the Ohio Arts Council's writing gallery. I love it too. So you said something early that I really, well first, I want to say, uh, Sarah Vance Waddell noted that it's a fabulous exhibition, so. Kudos. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, what, I, what you said a little bit earlier today when we were just chatting, uh, someone asked you, what is, what is art? And you oh. talked a little bit about the gesture. I would love for you to talk about yeah. that in, in regard to this exhibition. Yeah. Um, and I think that we're going to move to a location that we can hear a little bit better. We have yeah. a little bit of a fan, so apologies if there's issues with sound. And Amanda's going to tell us when to stop. Right here is good. So. Hopefully you all can hear us a little bit better. Yeah. Um, yeah so I was thinking about um, the gesture. So um, what the question initially was, is uh, art a concept? Is it an idea? And what I was saying is that um, you know, it could be an object, it can be an idea, it can be research-based. But you know, to me, art is um, recontextualizing, reimagining um, what can exist based on what came before it, right? So taking the materials that now are, you know, in the world. We, uh, Lauren Davies has access to, you know, mass-produced textiles. That wasn't even possible, right, like 50 years ago, um, at least not for a single individual artist to just be able to send something like that away. Um, so materials are part of that. Uh, but what I would say, it's a really a, a gesture of what is consistent with all of these artists that a gesture is about um, kind of centering and thinking through, um, yes, ideas, yes, materials, uh, yes, concepts, you know, large ideas, um, but it's also a thing that I think is consistent. It, it could be just prioritizing, um, you know, thinking that if we have this moment and we are all going through it, um, what is the story here right now? And so, Artists typically are sort of alchemists. They're taking something that pre that existed before them and reimagining it, it as something new that's telling something that reflects that moment in time. Um, it's why I'm interested in contemporary art and not, you know, as much as I am a student of art history and that's my background, I really love working with contemporary artists because it's the time that's relevant to my life and I care about you know, the world that I live in, and, and I think everyone should care about the world that we're living in. And, and so therefore, you know, artists, the gesture that you think you see consistently around here is that these artists are really thinking about how can I take a gesture and, you know, prioritize not just my own safety, not just my own freedom, but, you know, that of the larger world. Um, so they're working within their kind of immediate um, purview, the ground upon which they stand, knowing that it will have that larger effect upon the world. So as a, a viewer coming into an exhibition, what I love particularly about contemporary art is that it's better as a, kind of a, an opportunity for conversation, in my opinion. Yeah. Like, I love coming to galleries and museums with folks that don't typically go because the fresh perspective oh, yeah. allows me to see it so differently. So yeah. um, my question to you is, is what do you get most excited about when you have uh, viewers in a gallery setting? Like how, what is your most valued interaction within that? And what do you suggest for folks that maybe coming to a gallery mm -hmm. to meet artwork that isn't their norm? I, I mean, I would say that there isn't one answer to what that art means, and that yes, as a curator, I'm writing about it, and I'm saying this is probably what the artist said, this is what I think, but knowing that it is up to you, it's what the meaning of art happens within the mind of the viewer, not within the mind of the 
curator, even the artist. The artist is giving birth to a thing that has a life that will exist in a meaning that will exist in our minds, right, as the viewers. And so I, I would encourage any viewers to the Rife Gallery to, you know, come to their own conclusions and to, you know, if you're just looking at it as a beautiful object, that's okay. That's, you know, that's a, that's, I think also what the artists would love for you to, you know, experience. Um, it doesn't have to be an X, Y, or Z kind of answer, right? It, it can absolutely be layers of meaning that happen within the mind of the viewer. We do have a comment from Amy. I love the reach and relationship that these artists are creating with the viewers. Cool. So that really kind of ties into That's just awesome. that conversation. Um, the other thing that I, that I think that folks, uh, when people are, are newly accessing art or art spaces, is to think about uh, art as new language. Yeah. So I think about artists as, you know, intaking information, visual experience, um, research, I would yes. say. Yeah. And then uh, creating things that go beyond language. So, yeah, I mean, I think the object is, that's often why um, artists are more interested in, in creating a visual thing, whether it be an installation, an object, a, you know, whatever you want to call it, that thing is something that can articulate multiple truths. And I do think that like a lot of what shift, I think offers the artisan shift is, is the ability to hold multiple truths at once that, you know, we know that the, particularly in terms of the pandemic, the, you know, the safety and security of other people rely on us being very uncomfortable and wearing masks if we don't want them, or even if we might not want them, and getting vaccinated if we don't want, necessarily want them, or, you know, staying home and just, like, doing all the things that we used to do in new ways. Um, and, I, and I hope that, you know, what we're offering viewers is, a, is more than one truth and you know that can be really a beautiful thing. Honestly, I think that you know um, that is the lens that art offers us in the world. Um, it, you know, we can we can only articulate so much in words. Words are limited. Um, I say as a wordsmith and writer, I know like my material is problematic, but nonetheless, you know, that's what I choose and, and hope to do as a curator to to find ways to support those meanings that, you know, um, that both I find the artist wants to, to provide, but then also that viewers can potentially encounter. Yeah. So I'm trying to think about, um, if, again, if you have questions, feel free to pop them into the comments. We have a little bit of a delay, so I'll catch them if I can. Um, this exhibition, the title is so titular. It like reaches into everything that's happening as we move to shifting to open to potentially shifting differently due to um, the Delta variant. Yeah. The, you know, the things that we're all experiencing shift speaks to that uh, expansively. Um, and it speaks very specifically too. I can I can take it on as part of the the gallery, and that we're shifting to be open for three days during the week. So we're going to have hours Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays from noon until five. And I hope I get to see all of you come and enjoy this work in person. Um, Amanda does a great job of getting us close and personal with the work through our videography here. Um, but it's really lovely to be able to see it with your own eyes um, and experience it and hear it and smell it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it, all of these works really appeal to multiple senses as well as your heart and your mind. Yeah, and so um, I would like to close out this curator's tour with a huge thank you to oh, you. Thank Maria. you and the Ohio Arts Council for keeping this amazing gallery up and running, you know, considering I'm sure it's been a challenging year for all arts organizations, just keeping our doors open. Yeah. So thinking about how we shift and still serve to 
build our, our cultural impact, right, and uplift and amplify voices of Ohio artists. Is, you've done a wonderful job with that. Um, so big thank you to Maria. Also, big thank you to the Ohio Arts Council's board, to the governor, and to the legislature for supporting this space. And before we leave you, I want to remind you that we have great programming that you have access to at rifegallery.eventbrite.com. And then um, come and visit us. Thank you so much for being with us. Have a great rest Thank of your you. day. Bye.